Well, somebody who's had first-hand experience with some of the key players in the current federal deadlock is the former New South Wales opposition leader, John Brogdon. Mr Brogdon was in that state's parliament at the same time as Tony Windsor and Rob Oakeshott, two of the three independents who will help decide who forms government. Mr Brogdon is now the chief executive of the Financial Services Council and he spoke to me earlier in our Sydney studio. John Brogdon, thanks for joining us. Thank you. You were in the New South Wales Parliament at the same time as Tony Windsor and Rob Oakeshott. In fact, he sat next to Rob Oakeshott for three years. Is the decision about the country's next government in safe hands? I think it is. Uh, and it's not simply about the individuals, uh, who I, some of whom I do know. I think it's more the fact that the independents themselves have almost a greater responsibility than anyone else to make this work. They want to demonstrate to Australia that a, a hung parliament, a minority government with independence sitting in the middle can actually work. And I take some solace from that, and I think the business community should take some solace from the fact that they want it to work, they want to make it work, they don't want an election in 6, 12, 18 months' time. They want to get a, a full three-year term out of this to prove that if you like, the experiment can and, and will work. Based on your experience uh, working with those men, how would you describe their styles and what do you think are the things that motivate them? It's an interesting point. Um, I, think they're, I think they're all very different. That's the first point. And to some extent, they may well reflect their own electorates. Rob, uh, who I know well, very well personally, is certainly more progressive. Um, his electorate is more urban than the other two. So whilst he is a uh, a, a non-urban member, I think he's more uh, regional than he is rural, if I can make that distinction. Uh, the other two members are classically rural, um, although Bob Catter has an electorate that goes to the coast. Um, so he does everything from farming to, to coastal issues, where, of course, Tony Windsor has a landlocked, um, very um, traditional country electorate. So they, they tend to reflect those, um, those uh, electorates in, in many ways. So I, I, think I, I think that all of the... Um, the benefits they've had of all having been in Parliament for some time is a plus. Uh, these three people in particular, who I think almost certainly will have the biggest call on putting together a new government, none of them are new to the Parliament. I want to ask you some political questions, but before I do, I want to ask you some questions in your capacity as the Chief Executive of the Financial Services Council. How will this political instability impact on Australian business? Well, to some extent, only as badly as Australian business wants it to. You know, we've seen some early commentary in the media, uh, from the media and from the business community, that this will be a disaster, it's a nightmare, um, that uh, it'll be terrible for stability and terrible for, for business in Australia. I think all of that is very unhelpful talk because, frankly, uh, I think people have to be careful what they wish for. What we've got now is a couple of weeks of uncertainty, um, but there's a very high likelihood we will have a government that is formed and will be formed by people who want that government to last and be stable. We should put our confidence in that. We shouldn't spook the markets, and business has to show responsibility. There's no doubt that the game is about to change massively. You won't be able to get, be guaranteed when you go and talk to the Prime Minister or the head of his or her department or the Treasurer or the relevant minister, that they can pretty much deliver on what they say. So that's changed. Well, doesn't that, that very thing mean that, just by its nature, we are going to be in a period of, uh, of uncertainty that's going to affect uh, business certainty and consumer confidence? But it won't be uncertainty if business realises that there's a bigger audience to convince of the benefits of the position they take. The other thing is, there's absolutely no way you could have got a mining tax in a hung parliament. Absolutely no way. No government would have just turned up and delivered a mining tax. And um, I don't think any independents would have voted for it without some level of public consultation. So we should not underestimate the flip side of the coin, and that is more consultation and more engagement on important policy issues. So you can be very negative and very short-term and say that this doesn't give us certainty, or you can realise the game has changed. And with the Senate, well, the game has changed for the next, next five you know, years or the next three or four or five parliaments, potentially. Don't forget how long the Democrats were around before they began to fade out, and, of course, before that, the DLP in the 60s and 70s. So this is not new for Australia, having a hung parliament. What is new is having, I think, a, a, a new political force that's evolving and looks to have, frankly, probably more legs than the Democrats and certainly the DLP. So that is a long-term change, but... Anybody who hadn't worked out that change was coming simply wasn't realising the reality of a changing Senate. So if I can ask you now to put on your hat as a former politician, what's your assessment about Labor's poor showing in New South Wales on the weekend and to what extent does that relate to the unpopularity of the New South Wales state Labor government? 
Well, the thing too is, you know, there used to be a great saying that this isn't one election, it's 150 by-elections. This was probably um, six or six state and two territory elections, if you look at it in those terms, which is why you got very different results state by state. Um, what is fascinating is that um, uh, what we all thought originally would happen, which was a massive swing in Western Australia against the government, that pulled up very short. There may be a change of seat there, but... And originally, when you looked at the, the mining tax, you would have thought, without a doubt, oh, Western Australia is going to wipe out the Labor Party. That didn't happen. Um, but Queensland swung quite strongly. Um, and New South Wales, once again, why, why is it that parts of Western Sydney voted um, Labor, against Labor very strongly and pro-Liberal? But the Central Coast increased and there were swings to the Labor Party up there. So, What do you think? Because you've spent, obviously, a lot of time on the ground mm. in these places. Have, have you got any sense why? No. <laughs> to be really honest, no, not, not on that Central Coast result, for instance. So it was, uh, it was a very mixed result, and it was, uh, w even within the states, it was regional. So, you know, the Central Coast region was different to the Western Sydney region, for instance. A massive swings to some sitting Liberal members. Um, Malcolm Turnbull, Joe Hockey had magnificent um, swings to them. Um, some of the Western Sydney Labor people, for instance, like um, Tony Burke, had a massive swing against him. So none of that really matters. Um, I'll never forget being told by... A, former state director of the Liberal Party, that you can take the swing and we'll take the win, which was a great line for, you know, big swings in safe seats. But it is... Um, uh, there's no doubt that... Uh, the hardest thing I found is that none, nothing in the election followed any orthodoxy. There was nothing. I mean, you know, you had former leaders falling out of trees and making commentary. You had um, the media very focused on the tactics of the campaign. It's wrong to say it was a campaign without policy. There was a fair amount of policy. There was a lot of policy. So you don't agree with that criticism that it, that it lacked vision, that both sides lacked vision? Well, there's vision and policy, I guess. Um, it was, I think it was um, a very tight election in terms of policy framework, but there was a lot of policy. There's no doubt about that. And some of it was, frankly, quite innovative. But I, I think the media um, uh, were unhelpful in terms of commenting more on the tactics. For instance the amount of um, consideration of the fact that Tony Abbott came to that first debate and, and stood off the stage on the floor. I mean, that dominated for days. Um, what he said was almost um, not reported. So I think it was nothing in that campaign um, was orthodox and the result has, in fact, delivered exactly that what as well. Do, what do you th uh, make of the fact that there was a, a high percentage of informal votes in some parts of New South Wales up to about 14%? What do you think that's about? Well... One interpretation is that because voting is optional preferential in New South Wales, there's confusion between filling in a whole ballot paper, which you don't have to do at the state level, uh, whereas you do have to at the, the federal level. People may have got used to in New South Wales after, what is it, over 20 years of optional preferential voting, they're just putting a one in a box. So um, that may be it, and it has, you know, it is confusing. You know, which one do I fill in completely? Which one do I just put a one in? Um, Queensland has optional preferential as well, I understand, so that may have had an effect up there. Maybe it was a part of the classic protest vote that people just didn't, couldn't bring themselves to, to vote for either side. And once again, that's been shown quite clearly well, in the outcome. Well, Rob Oakeshott has been saying that he thinks that we need to look at the way politics is conducted and mm. change it. And Tony Abbott said today that politics can be needlessly confrontational. What do you think? Does there, is the public looking for a change in the way politics is conducted? I, uh, I left Parliament about almost five years ago and I've been in business for the last four and a bit years. And... Uh, you look back at politics and you think, why? Why does it need to work like that? You know, why, why do we have so many of these old-fashioned, many senses old-fashioned, literally, you know, literally hangovers from, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years ago in the, in the British Parliament? They don't make sense in this day and age. Why do we do it that way? And those traditions, I think, um, I think don't hold much sway anymore. I mean, you know, where else... Where else in the real world do you right, do you work uh, until midnight with legislation and still think you make a lot of sense? I mean, it, there are some very silly elements, and they don't relate to modern lifestyles. Well, what about the party discipline, though, and, and Rob Oakeshott's idea that you could have some sort of a, a mix-and-match unity cabinet? Do you think that's a workable idea? Well, Rob's always been interested in the whole multi-party concept of sort of almost your unity cabinet, your unity party. Um, that, I don't think, could work in Australia. I, I think voters would lose confidence in a system where they thought they were voting for a Liberal, Labor, National, Independent, yet they get this pop period of, of, of a cabinet. Um, it's attractive in the sense of, you know, bringing the greatest thinkers and brains in the parliament together for the country's benefit, and I'm sure that's what Rob, in part, is arguing as well. 
it's not going to happen, I guess, is the, the first point to make, so it's an interesting debate. But it is on the edges of, of, um, of what sort of system do we have in Australia. And um, the US is hardly the best system in the world, but the ability for people to be appointed to positions to fulfil a job... Treasury, Secretary of Treasury is not a member of the Congress, not a member of the Senate, allows you to bring in highly talented people without, um, without putting them uh, through a parliamentary process. Now, some would argue that's a bad thing because they ought to go through the process, but others would say, why can't the smartest woman or man in the country do this job for a couple of years and then leave? So are we on the cusp of massive parliamentary reform in Australia? Oh, look, I don't know. Um, Certainly there's a, a lot of discontent around the country about state governments and about their role, fundamentally their role. Uh, and you look at the debate, or the negotiations on health funding in Australia now, what, six months ago when Kevin Rudd was Prime Minister. Western Australia stood out, Victoria came in at the last minute, South Australia said you can have our health system in five minutes and New South Wales followed pretty quickly. So the role of states has changed drastically. I found one point fascinating. If you looked at Julie Gillard's backdrop in her campaign launch, and this is no commentary on, on the launch, but it said better schools and hospitals, about five years ago or ten years ago, that was a state government slogan. Um, and, and that just shows you how much the game has changed. So people... It also reflects the fact that people don't really care whether you're state or federal, Liberal or Labor or independent. They just want their school to, to run well and their kids to get the best education and their hospital to get them in and out of the emergency ward as quickly as possible. And they don't, they don't, they're, not, they're not blurring the lines, they actually don't care about the lines. So maybe we are on the cusp of a bit of a change there. Are you still a member of the Liberal Party? Yes, I am. And you, as you say, you've been out of politics for a while now and had a reasonably low profile with a few public appearances here and there. Would you consider going back into politics? <laughs> this question, no. <laughs> still no. rule it out? Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm really enjoying the business world much more than I thought I would. Of course, there are no politics in business, as you know, um, Lee, so my skills don't get, used, uh, <laughs> don't get used well there. But um, uh, no, no, I've, I've, uh, I've enjoyed the business world a lot more. And maybe that's a reflection on the downside of politics, that, you know, you can get things done often much more effectively and efficiently in a business environment than you can in a political environment. Maybe that's a reflection. I don't know. But no, I've had my run and I'm, I'm very pleased to have moved on. John Brogdon, thank you very much. Thank you.